ancient texts, cryptic numbers, symbolic imagery depicting awesome apocalyptic events. For many, the Bible and its prophecies seem shrouded in mystery. Words like Armageddon and tribulation frighten millions, while others wonder how to avoid the mark of the beast or being left behind when the Lord returns. Can we understand the Bible? Yes. And Jesus holds your key to unlock a future without fear. Join us now as Mount Pisgah SDA Church presents Unlocking Revelation with Pastor Julian. Today's study, The Mark of the Beast. All right. Well, it's not yet noon. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Welcome, especially for those who are here for the first time, but more so also those who are watching on the internet. We welcome you to the Mount Pisgah Seventh-day Adventist Church and our continued study in the book of Revelation. Thus far, we have completed 18 lessons and we can see the finish line approaching. We have six more lessons to go meaning that today we will be doing lessons number 19 and 20 and then next sabbath we will be doing 21 and 22 and then on sabbath the 21st we will be doing our final two lessons lessons number 23 and 24. the mark of the beast now i say this much to you many things have been declared to be the mark of the beast Some say there is some supercomputer in Washington. Are you with me? That has the names of this. And some say it's some mark that only those who are initiated will be able to discern. Let me say this to you. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Yes, there is a mystery to God. Are you with me? Great is the mystery of godliness, he tells us in Ephesians. But God has revealed enough of himself. Even though there is a mystery to him, God has given enough of his self-revelation to us that he is no longer shrouded in complete mystery. God has made himself known to us in Jesus Christ. And he said to Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So yes, there is a mystery to God, but then there is a revelation of God also. And if we focus on what God has revealed, let me share something with you. Listen carefully. There, was a there is a certain character in the Bible that from a child, he always intrigued me. Melchizedek. And I remember in school, a professor saying to me, the Bible has not, God has not revealed enough of this, this person. I didn't accept that. Because I had in my mind, whatever God has revealed is enough. It is our understanding of the revelation. That's the problem. The problem is not in God's revelation. It's our understanding of the revelation. And God would have it that I met an uh, old Bajan man back in 1991. You know why you heard that, right? Yeah. And he proceeded to systematically take me through the book of Hebrews. I say that to say this. From a study of God's word, truths will emerge. And he has promised that if we seek, we will find. 
God will not tell us about the mark of the beast and keep us in such ignorance or make it so mysterious and mystifying. Not only that, but the, the servant of the Lord says, the greatest threat ever addressed to mortals is addressed to the worshippers of the beast. Are you with me? Then if such a threat, notice what the Bible says. If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture. Permit me, permit, permit me to use a Guyanese analogy. Permit me. And I can talk a little bit of Guyanese too. Them old rum fellas. When they want to talk, when they wanted to talk about how good they can drink, you know, how solid a drinker they were, they would basically say to their friends, listen, I ride a beer back. You know what it is to <laughs> in other words, when they're diluting the alcohol to ease the strength so that it can become palatable, they're basically saying, No. When I write beer back, meaning that they drink it without chaser. Do you know what is it? that's what the Lord is saying? The Lord is using that analogy. When his wrath is poured out, it will be undiluted with whatever chaser you want to dilute it with. His wrath is poured out without mixture. Unadulterated. So if the Lord is going to make such a threat, he is going to let us know what the mark of the beast is. Because what is his desire? To save his children. That's why he came. All right, let's go into our list. The beast of Revelation 13. In order to identify the mark, we must first identify the beast. In prophecy, what does a beast represent? Lift your heads for a moment. It is not something easy to do to pin the label of beast upon anyone or any entity. You must make certain that you have abundant evidence. So before we can do that, we must make sure that when we come to that conclusion, we have the evidence supporting us. In Bible prophecy, a beast represents what? A what? Shall be a kingdom or power. So we know that we are talking about a power or a kingdom that rules where? The world. This power is worldwide. All right. According to Revelation 13.1, this beast with a mark comes up out of the sea. What does water represent in prophecy? Waters are people and multitudes and nations and tongues. That is why the Bible says the voice of Christ is as the sound of many waters. You ever ask yourself, why does the Bible say that? Because when Christ speaks, he speaks for all his people. That is why his voice is as the sound of many waters. He speaks for his people. We read Revelation 21 to 8. Notice that this beast, which has a mark that I must not receive, has eight pronounced characteristics. On exhibit one, we have listed these eight points and identify the power they describe. Please study this exhibit carefully before going to answer the next question. All right, this is the exhibit here. It would receive its power, seat, and great authority. This beast receives its power, seat, and great authority. All right? It would become what? A worldwide power. Now, these are all identified. You know what they say? The proverbial saying, if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, then what? It's a duck. 
So we now must look at the characteristics of this power to determine what this power is. It would become a worldwide power. It would rule for 40 and 2 months. Now we discovered that 40 and 2 months is symbolic, is equal to or synonymous with 1260 days or time and times and half a time. 42 months and 30 days in the month brings us to 1260 days. All right? Time, right? 12 months times 24 months, right? And half a time, six months brings us to 42 months, 1260 days. So it is the same power, but the, the, the time that this power is to rule is given to us in three different um, ways in the book of Revelation. 42 months, time and times and half a time, time and time and the dividing of times, and 1260 days. It would be guilty of blasphemy. Now, lift your heads. We want the Bible to tell us what blasphemy is. All right? Now, what is blasphemy? When Christ said to the Jews, before Abraham was, I am. And they picked up stones to stone him. Right? And then he said to them, well, why, why are you looking to stone me? They said, we are looking to stone you for blasphemy because thou being a man, make it yourself God. So for someone to claim to be God, it is blasphemy. But there is also a second dimension to blasphemy. When Christ was about to heal the man, he said, your sins be forgiven you. And they reasoned within their heart saying what? This man is committing blasphemy because who can forgive sin but God? So one, for someone to claim that they are God is blasphemy. And for someone to claim that they can forgive sin is also blasphemy. And I say this much to you. We need not look no further than that man who sits as the pontiff. You know what the word pontiff means? The word pontiff means bridge. That's <laughs> making sense. The word pontiff means bridge. And why do you need a bridge? A bridge connects two separate entities. You're on one bank, you're in Brooklyn, and you want to go to Manhattan, so you're going to go across the Manhattan Bridge or the Brooklyn Bridge or the Williamsburg Bridge. It correct, connects two separate entities. So for the Bishop of Rome to claim to be the pontiff, it means that he is connecting two separate entities. He is connecting what? God and man. He has just made himself what? The, hold a second. The God man. That's what he has just made himself. Because for, listen, for someone to connect God and man, that person has to be both. To connect to God, you have to be God-like. To connect to man, you got to be man-like. So within this person, you must have both entities residing. Notice what has happened. The Bishop of Rome has just taken the place of Jesus Christ. The last time I checked, my Bible says there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And when Simon Peter confessed who he was, notice what Peter said. Thou art the Christ, 
the son of the living God, the Christ, the Christos, the one sent, is not just human being, but he is divine. That confession. So, the pontiff claims to be God. Blasphemy. But not only that, you must find both. Not only the claim to be God, but what? The claim to forgive sin. Are you with me? And guess what? We find it. Because through that papal system, through the papal system, you no longer kneel and confess your sin to the sin bearer. There's a reason why we confess our sins to Christ. When we confess our sins to Christ, what happens? He becomes our substitute because our sins are transferred from who? From us to, to him. And by the way, he is fully qualified to be our substitute. Why? His blood. Thank you. But when you go to a confessional booth, look, look at the danger. When you go to a confessional booth and you confess your sins to the priest, you are transferring your sin to another sinner like yourself. So where is your sin still? Right with you? Only the devil can invent such a system. But let me say this. There were those in times past who in faith that's all they knew. And God seeing the sincerity of their heart accepted their confession because they were not taught about the love and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So this power is a blaspheming power and the power resides right there in Rome. He is God on earth. That's what he claims. Vicar of the Son of God. He's called the Holy Father. Holy Father. The Bible says, there is no one holy but, but God and call no man Father. That is why we don't have God Father. You see the blasphemy in that term God Father? What are you combining in the term God Father? You, you, you see, you see what is combined? The blasphemy, you're com combining what? Divinity and humanity. That's another subject for another time. It would receive a deadly wound which would heal. Then the entire world would follow him. And this took place in 1798. When the French army invaded Rome, captured the Pope and took him prisoner to France. The Roman Catholic Church was shaken to its core. But guess what? It has recovered. And today, today, the Pope is looked upon as the conscience of the world. He is going to gather. He went there and he prayed in Israel at the, at the Wailing Wall. And it was only him who was able to bring the Muslims and the Jews together. And they're supposed to be having a meeting in Rome where they're gonna he gonna gather them to pray for peace. Would have what? The mystic number what? Six six six. This number is not mysterious. God would not give us something in His Word that we can't decipher. He doesn't have that written on His crown anymore because it was exposed, and the crown doesn't carry that writing anymore. Are you with me? Oh, yes. But it used to be there. Vicar of the Son of God. Vicarious filii day. And when you take the Roman numerals and you add it up, it added it up to 666. It added up to 666. Would be what? Religious power. It is involved in worship. Lift your heads. As we discovered when we began, Lucifer's quest 
I would be like the Most High. That's what he wanted. Now, he didn't want to be like God in character. That wasn't his desire. Well, I, you know, I will be God-like. In other words, the character of God must be mine. No. He wanted all the attributes that he coveted that belonged to divinity only. And he desired that which belonged to God alone, and that is worship. And if God set up a system of worship, and Lucifer wants worship, what do you think he would do? He would set up a system of worship. And he would use human agents. That's you. The conflict is resolved through human agents. Us. We will resolve the conflict. Finally, it would war and would war with and persecute the saints. Lift your head. Every, well, I don't know if they teach that in school now, in high school now. But you read about the Inquisition. Back then when the, you know, teaching was teaching. And you knew who was at the, who was at the, the source of the Inquisition. You, oh, listen to me, to profess the name of Christ was to put a target on your back. And many died. Many were burnt for the name of Jesus Christ. And by God's grace, they died looking for a better resurrection. And that resurrection is coming. Oh yes, no denying. The beast, mark of authority. Since we have now positively identified the beast as the papacy, let's permit the papacy to tell us what its mark is. All right, let's review them. And you, 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 um, when you look at your exhibit, you will see Rome telling us what? That Sunday is an institution of the Catholic Church. Sunday has no other source other than the Catholic Church. And we find in the Bible, before Sunday worship actually came in, they were worshiping who? The sun. Worshiping what? The sun. Now, I've shared this before, but there are some new folk here. Permit me, those who have heard it, to share it again. Don't get bored or tired. The battle is for worship. God has his day that he has set aside. The seventh day Sabbath. As a matter of fact, he is the first recorded Sabbath keeper in the Bible. Not Adam and Eve. God himself. Because in Genesis 2, 1 to 3 we read, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work. And God resting. All right? Now, for Satan, or, well, then he was Lucifer. You want what belongs to God alone. You will now set up a system that will be rival to his, but similar. Are you with me? And this is, he's the master of counterfeit. There's the synagogue, of, there's the church of Christ, there's the synagogue of Satan. As I mentioned, there's the, there's the seal of God, there's the mark of the beast. There's the divine trinity and then there's the satanic trinity. And a whole host that we can go through. You want that which belongs to God only. All right? God has a day. Reason. He's going to have a day. But listen to this. He's not going to expose himself and come out and say, listen, this is my day that I want you to rest and worship and give allegiance to me. He's going to hide it. So what he's going to do? The day that he's going to choose, he's going to veil it, he's going to dress it up in Christian clothes. So when you look at it, right, it looks what? Looks Christian and good. But when you take off the clothes, what, 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 what would you deserve? Nakedness and rottenness. Pay close attention. He's full of pride. Huh? I will be, I will be, I will be. 
pride. And pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And his fall was because of pride. Now listen to this. If he's so full of himself, right? Everything he does is self-directed. Whereas God is not self-directed, but the principle of love is the principle of giving. The principle of love is the principle of selflessness. Love does not seek its own. For God so loved that he gave. But self draws to itself. He has to choose a day to rival the day that God has set aside. His name means light bearer. Loose means light and Pharaoh means to carry or to bear. Lucifer, son of the morning. Right? The morning star. I ask you this question. Seeing that his name is synonymous with light. Huh? And he has to choose a day. Are you with me? What day you think he can choose? The first day of the week on the day that God made light. That's why he chose Sunday. Because Sunday, Lucifer, son of the morning. That's why he chose the first day of the week. Because, remember now, he's full of self. It reminds him of himself. But watch me now. First part of the mission accomplished, he got his day. But he has to pass it on to Christians. He got to sell it to the Christian world. He cannot sell it to the Christian world as a devilish day. Because nowhere in scripture is the first day of the week sanctified by God. Such a text does not exist. It does not exist. What does he have? He got a problem. But guess what? He's the master disguise and deception. So what does he do? Thank you. What does he do? He brings Sunday to us wrapped in Christian clothes. In honor, we are, when we worship on Sunday, we are proclaiming to the world that we serve a risen Savior. And the first day of the week speaks to his resurrection. Oh yes, we serve a risen Savior. Notice, it's wrapped in Christ. But has God left us a memorial? Did Christ leave us a memorial of his death, burial, and resurrection? Yes, he did. Not Sunday. Baptism. We die to self. We are buried. And what? We rise again to walk in newness of life. So there is a memorial of Christ's resurrection. Not Sunday, but baptism. So, the Roman Catholic Church now, through the devil, inspired by the devil, established a false system of worship. I was watching the, the channel, you know they have a channel, and I was watching it yesterday, a little bit of it yesterday evening, and they were talking about the blessings of Mary. All the blessings that come from the Blessed Virgin. As a matter of fact, they are pray we must pray. We, listen, we don't pray to have a will or the mind of Christ. We pray to have the mind of Mary. As Mary was submissive to the will of God, we know what? Must pray and ask God to have what? A submissive mind like Mary. But Paul tells us, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Let's go. I'm sorry. It seems incredible that the papacy has been able to change the day of worship from Saturday to Sunday and have virtually the entire world follow. Did the papacy really change God's fourth commandment, Sabbath, to Sunday, or only think that they have changed it? He shall what? 
think that you why it's impossible only God can change his law but notice what he says I will not alter or change anything that has gone out of my mouth when God speaks he doesn't say oops he does not misspeak they will think to do it but forever O oh Lord thy law is fixed where in heaven forever and forever means forever what was God's criticism of his ancient priests or pastors you have caused many to stumble at the law nothing new it happened back then ye have not kept my ways but have been what partial in my law and to be partial in, in my law means what you pick and choose what you want. How did the people in Hosea's day regard the great things of God's law? They were counted what? As a strange thing. Today. Today. God's seventh day Sabbath, even though it is written in the Ten Commandments, is counted as a strange thing to many people. When you share with them that this is what God requires, they have a whole host of reasons why it should not be. God said the religious leaders in Ezekiel's day were profaning holy things, putting no difference between profane and holy things, and showing no difference between the clean and the unclean. What specifically did he have in mind? What? They have what? Hid their eyes from my, my Sabbaths. Even back then and today. And you know, the Catholic Church was successful in changing the day from Sabbath to Sunday in this regard. In order to not be identified with the Jews, But the Bible says salvation is of the Jews. And ye are, if ye be Christ, ye are Abraham's seed. And he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, but he's a Jew who is what? One inwardly. All Christians are Jews. We are spiritual Jews. So from the time you start distancing yourself from the Jews, you're distancing yourself from salvation. What did God say about attempts to change his law or word in any way? Do not add or diminish a single thing because he's going to prove us liars. If I add to his word, he counts me what? A liar. Heaven and earth will sooner pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail. As some would say, not even the dotting of the I or the crossing of the T is to be diminished from God's law. Popular churches are embarrassed. When we ask the papacy, how could you change God's holy law? They are embarrassed. But their response is even more embarrassing to the Protestants. And you see exhibit number three, right? Because Rome claims what? What does Rome say? All they have authority. God has given them authority. But the only way you can find that authority is in the Bible. And you can't find it. And the other Protestant churches now are embarrassed because Rome claims. You may, Rome declares, you may say that you're a Protestant. But you're really not. The mere fact that you are honoring Sunday is a testimony that you are a child of mine. And watch this. Pay close attention. And it's an easy trip back home to mother. Why? Because they, as we would say, they what? The umbilical cord has not been cut. And what is the umbilical cord that connects the mother to all the others, all the churches of Babylon? Sunday. 
And Rome declares the only Protestant church is the Seventh-day Adventist church. She declares that. That is. Rome has confessed that. And to prove that Babylon's daughters are still part of the family, the Anglican Church or the Church of England came about, came as a Protestant church. Today, they came out of the Catholic Church, but today, they have gone where? Right back, because a Catholic priest can officiate in an Anglican Church, and an Anglican priest can officiate in a Catholic Church. The Lutheran Church, founded by Martin Luther. Now, you would think that the Lutheran Church, Luther was one of the pillars of the Protestant Reformation. Today, Rome and the Lutheran Church has come up with a statement of understanding. And this is what they're basically saying. This is what they've said. Listen, it was just a matter of semantics. And semantics basically is wordplay, how we understand words. This is what they're saying. They are saying that there is no difference between their doctrine the doctrine of Rome and the doctrine of Luther. And what are they, this is basically what they're saying. Listen. Luther stressed faith. They stressed works. But when you combine the two, they were, it's just where the stress was placed. Rome stressed salvation by works, but works are a part of our salvation. Luther stressed faith. Faith and works go together, so there, there is no need for a Lutheran church. And if Luther were here today, he would be beating his path back to Rome. I tell you something, he died a Protestant. And there was no way, well, I, I, I mean, you don't. But Luther died believing what he believed, that the bishop of Rome was the beast. And he wrote that. Where is the beast mark, beast mark placed on people? In their right hand or in their forehead? The forehead is what? The seat of the intelligence, the mind. And the hand is what? Works. Faith and what? You believe in your mind and you carry it out with what? Your hand. But notice where it is. In the right hand. Pay close attention. The Son of God was told to sit where? At the right hand of the Father. So the devil wants to make sure that he binds you tight by placing that mark where? Not literally, but symbolically. Are you with me? Christ was not literally placed at the right hand of the Father. You're quiet. It signifies a seat or position of authority. But when he ascended to heaven, he ascended not to sit at the right hand of the Father, but to what? Be our intercessor. When the work of salvation is over, guess what? That place and position of authority that is invested in him by the Father, he now what? Fully assumes. Do people who now observe Saturday, I'm Sunday, Sunday as a holy day have the mark of the beast? And that no man might buy or sell, save he that what? Had the mark. The mark, the mark of the beast has not yet been instituted. There is coming a time when the Sunday law will be in, a law will be passed in Congress. And let me show you how it's going to be passed. Are you with me? Don't listen, listen to me. I'm not saying that what I'm about to say to you is I know better than anybody. But I'm hit, I'm, this is what the servant of the Lord reveals. There's a lot of speculation and a lot of stuff being printed out there, uh, you know, about this movement and that movement. Listen carefully to me. You don't need to be aware of any secret knowledge but exactly what the Bible says. Amen. Listen carefully. How many of us have been in these United States in excess of 30 years? 30. 
All right, good. Listen to me. There was a time when you could leave a job at 10 o'clock, and at 10.15, you get another one. I know what I'm talking about. But as we look at this country, listen to me. When I came here in 1979, at the age of 24, my grocery bill was $12 a week, and I ate like a cow. Trust me, it was $12 a week. A gallon of orange juice was 99 cents. Are you with me? Milk, a quarter milk was 10 cents and all that stuff. Let me say this to you. We have seen over the years what is happening in America. We've seen it. Watch this. Righteousness exalts a nation. Sin is a reproach to any people. God blessed this country. God blessed this country because the founding fathers were faithful to God according to the light that they knew. And it is reflected in the constitution that they wrote that guarantees a certain freedoms to worship that the government shall not make any law favoring one religion over another. Government must stay out of religion. God was there guiding those men. Are you with me? Now, pay close attention. There is moral decline and decay in this country. Every week, there is some new crime, some this, some something. And the call is being made by the religious leaders. America, come back to God. Come back. Pay close attention. Let me make something clear now and then I'll give, let me make a statement now and I'll expand on it. The Sunday law will not be passed against Seventh-day Adventists. Are you with me? When the law will be passed, they are not going to sit in Congress to legislate a law against Seventh-day Adventists. No! The law will be passed to reform this country, to bring it back to God. But who is at the, who is behind it? The devil. All of these football games and stuff, the sporting events that are taking place on Sunday, there is a call that America is now becoming a godless nation. Come back. And the legislators now will be influenced. Hold a second. Not only the morality, pay close attention, the natural disasters, the tornadoes, the floods, Preachers are going to start preaching with more fervor that America needs to come back. And only those legislators who will support bringing America back from the path that it's on. Now we know it's on a godless path right now. The the highest authority in the land, the president of this country, has openly declared that that which God established in Eden is no longer binding. What do you expect? And so with that intent, in order to reform this country and bring it back to God, that law will be passed. Watch me now. Are you with me? Satan is doing it for one reason and one reason only. 
that which he cannot influence, he's going to try to do by force. And under this threat, no man might buy or sell. Those who are not worshipping the beast and his image, listen to me, you don't need no supercomputer to identify you. Did you hear me? From the time you got up this morning and put your clothes on with a Bible in your hand, you've already identified yourself. Let it remain God's way. From the time you got up this morning and walk out of your house with your Bible in your hand and people beholding you, where else you're going? You have just what? Declared who you are. They don't need no secret information. From the time you honor God, you have exposed yourself. How did the Hebrew boys stand out? Talk to me. It's not, hold, hold a second. What I'm saying, their faithfulness to God identified them as worshippers, as not worshippers of Nebuchadnezzar's image, but as worshippers of the true and living God. Their faithfulness to God. And all faithfulness to God is what will identify us. That is what will identify us. They don't need any secret information. Granted, they do that. Are you with me? They do that. But watch me now. The change that takes place in the heart uh -oh, will be manifest in the conduct. You can't claim to be a worshiper of God at that time and not stand The test will be brought to every soul. And so, this here, you can't buy or sell until, unless you have that mark. Every Sabbath keeper will be known. Sure. I know they collect information. But that information can be null and void, become null and void by a change of this. Uh-oh. In these last days, God has commanded his angels to hold back the winds of strife from the earth until something happens to his people. What is that? It says, hurt not the earth till we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. Lift your heads. The winds are ready to blow. But God in his mercy is saying, hold back. Not yet. There's a ceiling that must take place. And those who have not heard what the seal of God is and what the mark of the beast is. And notice where it comes, the seal, the, where the angel comes in Revelation 7. From the sun rising. And you notice, Revelation 7 answers the question that is raised in the last verse of Revelation 6. For the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? And Revelation tells 7 tells you who will be able to stand. Those who have what? The seal of God in their foreheads. In other words, those who have made a conscious decision to follow Jesus Christ all the way and to do his will. Who will receive God's wrath in the last days? Those who receive the mark of the beast. Let me make something clear. The majority of God's children are going to church tomorrow. I'm going to say it again. The majority of God's children will be going to church tomorrow. And many will be going to church tomorrow not knowing that they have missed the appointment by one day. 
You know, when I see them on Sunday morning going to church, and you know you want to do a little witness, I would turn to them and say, see, it's good that you're going to church, but you missed the appointment by one day. And you, and you get their attention. And I, I would say to them, you're one day late. God is going to let light shine. And like I did maybe last week, many of us sitting here used to miss the appointment by one day. But God in his goodness, God in his love, made his light to shine upon us. And we are here today at the right time, at the right place for the right appointment. And those who receive so, they have not yet received the mark of the beast. But when truth comes and we reject truth, then and only then, this is pronounced upon us. But some of them today have not rejected. A lot of the preachers, yes, because you talk to them in private, as I told you, those, these two brothers who I did a funeral with, when I be waiting to do the funeral and I'm just be talking as pastors, they're brothers from Linden in Guyana. And they told me, they told me, so yes, Saturday is the Sabbath. We keep the Sabbath in private, but we have church on Sunday. They told me that. So they know, they know. And the blood of God's children will be on their garments. The test of loyalty. How does God decide who? It is we serve. His servants, ye are to whom you obey. If you obey me, I am your servant, you are my master. That's all God is saying. If you love me, keep my commandments. How does God count me if I am, I am neutral? He that is not with me is a... There's no neutrality, you know. No. We are either for God or against him. According to Revelation 13, 11, John saw another beast rise up out of the earth about the time that the beast of verse 1 went into captivity. Whom do you think this beast represents? The United States. Pay close. A beast represents power, right? Watch this. As this the first beast in Revelation 13 is going into captivity, right? This second beast is coming up. Now, the Pope went into captivity in 1798, right? America declared its independence when? In 1776. So as Rome was starting to feel the elements of war approaching, the United States was what? rising up. And notice where this beast rose from, the earth. If waters represent people, it means that this nation is rising not in a populated place where there's a lot of people. This beast is coming up out of the earth. And when the United States arose with the founding of the people, yes, we know there were some Indians here, no denying. But this was an empty territory reserved by God for the proclamation of his name. What two tragic things does the second beast cause people to do? To worship the first beast and to receive a mark in the hand or forehead. The United States will do what Rome did. Will be just like Rome. And if Rome instituted Sunday worship, then what? The United States is going to what? Do the same. And like I said, this is, as I explained to you earlier, this is what will take place. There will be moral and economic decline plus the climatic, the, 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 the hurricanes are going to get worse, the tornadoes are going to get worse, the floods are going to get worse, and preachers will be calling America and reminding them, reminding America, as God discharged his wrath on Sodom and Gomorrah, God is going to deal with this country. And the call is to know what? Come back. You've heard them. Come back to God. Come back. Come back. 
How will the second beast convince people they should listen to him? And deceive them by what? The means of those miracles which he had power to form. Today, preachers specialize in miracles. Once a preacher can have a Holy Ghost extravaganza, extravaganza, extravaganza attended by miracles, guess what? He's genuine. People flock there. But miracles are not a test. To whom will the second beast make an image? Saying that they should what? Make an image to the beast which had the wound and did live. Make an image to the, like the Roman image. And what is the Roman image? Sunday. So in these United States, where religious liberty is guaranteed, the law will be passed forbidding religious liberty. And God will step in and deliver his people. God's people lovingly obey. What the disciples say about whether we should obey God or man. What did they say? We ought to obey God rather than man. What can I do to make certain I will not receive the mark of the beast? Of God and the faith of... Listen. You know what the wise man said? Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. Let's pause a moment. Look at that text. If I fear God and keep his commandments, none of the threats will ever fall on me because the wise man says, this is the whole duty of man and I'm performing the whole duty of man. I am on God's side. I may not be able to identify the beast or who the, what the mark or the image is, but the bottom line is, I am fearing God and keeping his commandments. I'm safe. God's last warning message, God's last message to the world is Revelation 14, 6 to 12. It includes what? Worship the creator. Avoid receiving the mark of the beast. Is it now clear to me that a person who receives the mark of the beast is lost? And the answer is yes. Because I would have made a conscious decision to reject truth and hold on to the tra traditions of men. And notice what um, we are told. In vain do they worship me, Christ said, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. There is a worship that is not in vain. And then there is a worship that is in vain. The worship that is not in vain is the worship of Abel. The worship that is in vain is the worship of Cain. Both are worships, but only one God accepts, and that's the worship of Abel. He did not respect the worship of Cain, even though Cain came to worship. <laughs> are they lost because they received the mark, or... Are they lost because they're rebellious, refuse to change, and accept Jesus' offer? Which, which one it is? This one. Refuse. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye will what? Perish with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. When I decide to accept Jesus fully and fully follow him, what happens? I will what? Find rest unto my soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Some year, this was back in oh, maybe 1981. There was this lady who we studied and shared the Sabbath truth with. Old Baptist, she was 60 something years old. And after we finished studying and showing her, the lady jumped up out of her seat and she cried out, I know something was missing. She cried out in joy, I know something was missing. And those of us seated here who have come from darkness into light, you know something was missing. The Spirit of God huh, would not give you rest until you made that decision to follow Jesus. Jesus is waiting at the door of my heart 
for me to answer, will I decide now to receive his glorious sign as evidence that I accept him as my Savior, my, accept him as my blessed Redeemer. Is Jesus Christ your Redeemer? Oh, yes. Raise your hands with me. Amen. And as we always conclude, behold the man, creator, redeemer, intercessor, and soon coming savior. Behold the man. Thank you for joining us at Mount Pisgah Seventh-day Adventist Church. We pray that you have been blessed and inspired as you listen to God's words today. For more information or for further study, please visit our website at www.mountpiscasda.org. Be blessed.